Okay, so a little bit about me. My name is James Frizzy. I am a professor at Cosumnes River College and I teach um, courses in psychology. But um, why I was hired to teach was, uh, I was hired to teach in my specialty, uh, neuroscience. And so I taught biological psychology for a long time. But in addition to that, I was hired to teach statistics. And that's the class that you're taking now. And that's the class that is a better story. That's a good story why I went into biopsychology, but uh, the one about statistics has a lot more to do with uh, something I think will be useful to you rather than uh, just personal stuff. So I, I went to a Christian high school that um, was not really academically uh, a college prep environment. Uh, it was a good school. They taught us to be... Um, conscientious of one another and good citizens, but they didn't really prepare us for college level study. So from that perspective, I didn't get to college ready to do college level work. And that might be like a lot of you, uh, that you don't feel you're prepared to do the work is gonna be required of you. That situation for me was interesting because I, I was a college athlete. So I got to, I was a division one collegiate athlete. I was a diver, so I was on the swimming and diving team at UC Irvine. That situation really benefited me because it got me into the college, it got me into uh, the athletic department which had support services for me. I go to college and I start majoring in chemistry. I eventually switch majors to cognitive science. Now cognitive science is the study of basically the human brain's capacity to do things other than move your body around and keep your blood pressure at a certain level. So the thinking, the memory, the language, um, that's cognitive science in a nutshell. It's under the rubric of psychology. I started studying cognitive science after my grandfather had a stroke. His recovery interested me in neurolinguistics. So that's kind of where I, I began my journey there. But because I switched majors, I had to go and change into the to the statistics um, realm so generally in mathematics there's the calculus route and there's the statistics route calculus would be for um, things like you're going into physics for people who are going to do research they need to learn the statistics side of mathematics the first class i took in statistics was i think it was psych stats one uh, uc irvine had three uh, sections. Instead, at, at CRC, we have two. We have two semesters that you generally go to. They had three quarters, and so those three quarters were fall, winter, and spring. And the fall, winter, and spring, you had to take one stats class in fall. If you didn't pass it, you had to retake that same one, like psych stats one. If you passed it, you could move on to psych stats two. And again, the same thing, if you pass Psych Stats 2, you could move on to Psych Stats 3, which would be completing your mathematics requirements for the lower division requirements of stats. That's, that's what you guys have, so check it out. You're learning in 16 weeks what I had an entire year to learn. So you're doing even more than I did. It's even more difficult to cram all that learning into uh, 16 weeks. But like I told you, I wasn't prepared to do mathematics when I got to college, and so I took that first stats class, which basically, if you can think about it, it's like the first third of our class here. I didn't know how to study. I didn't know study skills for college courses. I didn't know what was expected of me. I didn't like the math. It wasn't something I was interested in. The teacher was, I'm not going to put her on blast on the internet, but she, uh, she was not approachable. And I struggled. And there they give you uh, A plus A, a minus, B plus, B, B minus, etc. Well, the first quarter, I got a C minus. Now, what that means is the class was like 400 students. So there's, they, they take a, they curve the class. So the, they, they put it on a, on a curve. And then the middle person, what we call in, in statistics, we would say um, the median or P50 or the 50th percentile. Um, if, if you got the middle score of all the students that took it, you got the middle score, you were the lowest person to pass. And so that was me. I was the lowest person to pass. I got a C minus in that class. And it was the first C minus I'd ever gotten. And I was shocked, dismayed, and just almost confused about what to do. I was on the diving team and swimming and diving team. And 
I was making friends and, and I, I liked being at college and I realized if I don't pass these classes, I won't be eligible to dive. I won't be, be able to stay here at, at the university. And so I had some pressure. I had, to, I had to do something. But I didn't necessarily have a goal at the time. So don't feel like I had some sort of higher level mission that I was on. And that's why I just had to persist. It was really the, I, I was ashamed at, that I got a C minus and I, I thought, am I bad at math? It's a feeling a lot of people have that they're just bad at math. I never felt strong in math. Again, my high school curriculum didn't really lead me to be some sort of a math expert. I was kind of stuck, I didn't know what to do. But because the report cards came in and because I was on the team, uh, we had to submit our grades to, to be eligible to compete. And so they found out I was you know, near that failing level. So I got put on the academic probation of the athletic department and they required me to come in nightly to a study session and at that study session we were required to sit there and do our work and there was someone monitoring us then i became aware that it was i had tutors available i could have someone tutor me in something and so I thought well maybe that's a good idea to do that so the next semester i got a tutor uh, next quarter excuse me i got a tutor the tutor was helpful and i redoubled my efforts from that first quarter where i i felt like maybe I didn't put forth enough effort. I started to really push myself to ex exceed my previous level. And, and here's why. You remember how I said that the class is curved? So that means of the 400 people that were there, well now there's only 200 because the other half had to go back and take psych stats one again. And so they had failed and they had to retake it. They were in that sort of holding pattern of if you don't pass that class, you don't get to move on to the next one. The 200 people, I was the lowest person who passed and got to go take the next hard class, the harder class than I had passed barely before. So I knew in my mind, this is gonna be even more difficult. And so I redoubled my efforts. I got that tutor in the athletic department and I began to really focus my efforts on studying. I still didn't like math. It wasn't something I enjoyed. It was something to endure to get past that and get a college degree. That was basically the sort of gist of what I was doing. I didn't really have the aim of, of anything at the time. But for lack of a better thing, I stayed in college and I really dedicated myself to studying and studying hard. And at the end of that next quarter, this is the winter quarter, I got a C. And at the same time, while I was elated to get a C, because it was better than the C minus. Again, on a curve, I'm at the low end. What was cool is, is that from the, the beginning class, although I was the lowest person to pass, now there's a bunch of people that went on to the second quarter and they didn't get to pass because they got scores below me and I got a C. And so I, I was encouraged by that success, but I was also like C's are not what my goal is. I wasn't satisfied with a C. I, I didn't want to be rated that way. I it was embarrassing to me to get a C because I thought that C's are for average people and nobody thinks of themselves as average despite the fact that we all are average. If we weren't, they, then averages wouldn't be what they are. But we'll get to that in chapter three. I also realized that now the 200 people that I took the second quarter with are now only 100 that are moving on to that third quarter. So I started going to the TA's office hours. I started going to that professor's office hours, which I didn't like her, but I, I wanted to pass and I wanted to redouble my efforts. I stopped working as much as I was working um, outside of school and I invested my time and my efforts into passing statistics because I knew I was now going up against the hundred best people of, of those past semesters and I knew I was not on their level. I mean, obviously having been with them for two quarters, they had demonstrated their knowledge by passing and getting through. And I knew I had to work harder than all of them because they were better than I was at math. That was just an accurate assessment of where I was and who I was at the time. And I responded and I worked harder and I kept getting tutoring in the athletic department. I kept going to the TA's office hours. I was going to the professor's office hours. I set up a study group with the folks. That was a mixed bag because they were all competing against each other. Nonetheless, I lowered my hours at work and I put those hours into studying statistics. You know, if I can just pass this class, 
then I can move on with my education, do whatever I do, and I, I won't be a math person. I won't, I won't study math. I won't, I won't involve math in my life. It'll just be something other people do. That last quarter, with all of my efforts, redoubled again, I was eating, drinking, and sleeping statistics. Quarters are not like our semesters that are 16 weeks, they're only 10 weeks, so you can really focus yourself in quarters. But also the information's coming at you, you know, faster than it would in the slow paced semester. So I get my grades at the end of the year and I got a C minus. I've never felt so much shame and joy at the same time. Shame because again, C minus, it just sort of struck me as, well, you're, you're below average. I, I always thought of myself as being more competent than that, but I wasn't. That's, that's an accurate assessment of where I was. So I had this idea that, you know, I'm bad at math. And I'm sure a lot of you have that same idea that you're bad at math. Many of you are gonna be sitting there listening to this and going, why are you teaching statistics if you got near failing grades uh, at UC Irvine when you took this class? And why, if you're telling us that's an accurate assessment of your abilities when you were in undergrad, why are you somehow able to now teach us statistics? And that's a, that's a fair question. Let me explain. Those are accurate grades that really showed where I was then. They don't show where I am now. The story between then and now is even more complex. But that C minuses, the C minuses that I got in statistics were accurate reflections of how well I understood statistical procedures, theories, formulas. At the time, that's how I was. I was bad in statistics. Before you drop this class and go try and take another one, um, I am the best person to teach you this class. So you're lucky to have me. Stick with me and I'll tell you more about why in a second. So I just passed barely my stats classes in college. I went on to major in cognitive science and I graduated. I didn't know what I wanted to do so I applied to be in the CHP uh, academy. I got an academy date here in West Sac, but I was down in Southern California. I didn't know much about it, but seemed like a good career opportunity until one of my best friends says to me, what would you do if you pulled me over and I had a bag of weed? And I was like, oh, how much weed? You know, at the time it was illegal in California to have marijuana. And he said, well, um, how much? And I, I, and I said, I, I don't know. Like if, if it was a little bit, I'd just take it and throw it away. And if it was a lot, you know, I'd I'd arrest you for trafficking. And he goes, yeah, then you'd be a bad cop. And you don't want to be a bad cop. And I thought about that and I was like, that's a really good critique. And then he goes, and you don't own any guns and you don't know how to fire them and you don't even like guns, another good critique. So I kind of felt confused. I canceled my academy date and I went back to my professor, not my stats professor. I went back to a professor that I had connected with who taught um, neuroscience classes and Specifically, he taught a class in memory that I really loved. His name was Michael Scavio. And uh, Dr. Scavio was a really, really good teacher and I appreciated him. And so I went to him and I'm like, hey, I just graduated. I don't know what to do. Um, I, I had started substitute teaching at one of the local high schools and that was not good. You know, I was wet behind the ears still, fresh out of college. I think I was 21 at the time. and. The students didn't respect me and I didn't, I didn't know how to handle a classroom. It wasn't a good experience for me. It wasn't probably not a good experience for them either, but uh, you know, I was a sub. He said, well, what did you like when you did your undergraduate stuff? And I was certainly not stats. And I said, well, I really liked your neuroscience class. I liked your memory class. He goes, you should be a neuropsychologist. You like people, you like studying the brain and um, go be a neuropsychologist. And I was like, well, I can't, you know, I, I got C minuses in my stats class, I'll never get into graduate school, right? Because I thought those C minuses were like a, a scarlet letter. They were like emblematic of my incompetence academically, right? That, that's the what I wore academically from there on out. And he said, I'll write you a letter of recommendation. And I said, well, I, I don't think I'm gonna get into these colleges. He said, go take the GRE, which is sort of like the SAT to get into grad school for college graduates. 
and I'll write you a letter. And he goes, I know somebody up at one of these grad schools and I'll write a letter to explain. So, um, by the way, I did, I did do well in my other coursework. In my other coursework at UC Irvine, I, I did well. I worked hard and I, I got good grades in those classes. Um, it was statistics that was the worst for me. That and chemistry, organic chemistry is terrible. So difficult for me. Anyhow, um, I applied to this low level grad school. It's called California School of Professional Psychology. And um, I got in, couldn't believe it, but I got in. And I had applied to be a PsyD, which is basically like a lower level doctorate of psychology, not a PhD, but a, a PsyD. And then I got there and one of the leaders of the department said, why did you apply to the PsyD program? I said, well, I didn't think I'd get into the PhD program. And he said, do you want to just do clinical work? Is that all you ever want to do? Or do you want to be able to do research? Do you want to be able to teach? Do you want to be able to have broader options? And I was like, I'd like broader options. And he goes, well, let's apply to the PhD program too. I did, I got in, I went there. And the first class that they had me take was freaking statistics. I knew it, the gig is up. I don't belong in grad school. They are making me take the class that they must have seen it on my transcripts and, and thought, this guy can't do stats. Let's, let's get him out of here so we don't waste time on him um, now. But the situation was different. My professor, um, his name was Dr. David Tanner. He taught at uh, Cal State Fresno and he was taught statistics. And he was a very different professor than the first one I had. And he was, he had an attitude that transformed me because he had an expectation about me. And it's one that, while I'm very different from him personality wise, I have developed myself as a professor to emulate his expectations as a student. And that is he looked at me and he goes, and he looked at everyone in the class. It, it wasn't just me, but it was a genuineness with which he said, I know you can learn this. That's how fast we're gonna go. You have to learn this. You're gonna be scientists. You have to use statistics to do your research. So I'm, I'm here and you're gonna be here until you learn this and you can. And that expectation, his confidence that we could understand something that was so complex to me at the time, so confusing that I barely passed on an undergraduate level. Now at graduate school, he was telling me I could do it. He was giving, it wasn't that sort of pass or fail sort of um, mentality at UC Irvine, this sort of weeder course of statistics that we had. It was, you're here, you're going to do this, so let's go. His attitude was one that really enlivened me. And as I began to take his class, I was hearing some of the things that I'd heard in undergrad again, and it was making more sense to me. At the end of the first test, I got an A on it, and I thought, well, that's just because it was a review of what I had previously done. I thought that must just be it. I again take the next test, and I got an A on that too. And I thought, well, I must, I'm, I'm doing the right amount of studying. And they, I, maybe this is graduate school, so everybody here is good, and they're all learning it super well. Um, and so I'm, I'm barely competing. This is the narrative I have in my mind about my imposter syndrome. I don't belong here. I can't do this. Despite the fact that I was doing it, despite the fact that uh, he had confidence in us and really showed us a calm way of approaching a knowable subject that's very useful and important for the field of science that we were entering, I still didn't have any confidence in my own abilities. I aced the class. I get an A in the class. It turns out I got like the third highest grade in the class. Dr. Tanner at the end of the semester said to me, would you be my TA for next year students when they come in the first year students, graduate students, would you TA this class for me? That's something that um, graduate students do just to earn money because graduate school is extremely expensive. And so if we teach, then we can offset sort of our tuition costs, books, et cetera. And so I said, no. And he said, well, why not? He said, typically everybody wants to have a TA position. And I said, well, you don't understand something about me, Dr. Tanner. See, I got C minuses in undergrad and stats is really hard for me. And he said, I know, that's why I picked you. I was confused, I didn't understand what he meant. He said, I saw your transcripts. I, I know what you did at UC Irvine. And I also know what you're doing now in my class. 
that shows you're no longer at that C minus level. You're now at a higher level of stats and you're performing at a higher level. So why do you consider yourself still a C minus person? And I couldn't answer him at the time. I agreed to TA the class, but I still had that lingering imposter syndrome that I didn't know what I was doing right. Next semester in my own coursework, not just TAing people, but next semester in my own coursework, it was gonna get harder. And so I thought, ah, I'm not gonna be able to pass you know, multivariate statistics or EQS, structural equation modeling, these, these more advanced statistics that you gotta keep taking as you move on. I thought I'm gonna fail because I'm a failure, I'm bad at math. That attitude helped drive me just because of my personality. And I passed all those classes, I got A's in those classes, and yet I still didn't like stats or math. I thought it was the least fun part of what I did. I was a clinical neuropsychologist, so I was in the time going into internships dealing with patients in hospitals. And I was very good at that, and I competed from a low-level graduate school to get some very competitive internships at the VA, at the Children's Hospital, um, and then eventually at UCSF Medical Center in the Epilepsy and Neurosurgery Department. Then I got uh, an internship at Mount Sinai in New York. And then I did my postdoc at Columbia University Medical Center, one of these elite Ivy League institutions, the largest medical center in New York City, the largest city in our country. It, I moved up the ladder academically, but in my heart, I still had this perspective of I'm bad at math. I did, my, I did my dissertation. I used a MANOVA, which is a multivariate statistic, a derivation of a stat that we'll learn, the hardest stat we'll learn called ANOVA, an even more complex version of it. I did all that work independently. I got my PhD and I was working at Columbia. Somebody said, hey, there's an opportunity to, to teach because one of these professors uh, at a local college they, we have the CSU system here, like um, Sac State, and they have the CUNY system, the City University of New York. It's a very similar setup. And one of those professors got a disease and can't teach, and these cl this class is going on, and if these students don't have a professor, they're going to, um, they're going to not be able to graduate. And I thought, oh, uh, that's terrible. Uh, well, what class is it? And they said, oh, it's neuropsychology, and that's, that's what my PhD is in. And I was like, I got it. So I took the train from Manhattan out to Brooklyn, and I taught that semester, and I walked out of the first class teaching, and I, I came home and I told my wife, I said, I found what I want to do. You know, at the time I had been working for years to get where I was at Columbia, to, to do the clinical work. That's what I thought my goal was, but along the way, I found something else. I found that teaching, and I was teaching that, neuro, that neuroscience class, I think it was neuropsychology was the class I was teaching, and I'm still friends with several of those students who are now lawyers, uh, executives, uh, neurosurgeons, like pretty intensely successful people. It was, I always say it was my favorite class I ever taught, but who knows, you guys might be. Nonetheless, I loved teaching. And so Brooklyn College, uh, they hired me on the spot and then they're like, well, we'll see how you do and we'll see if we hire you again next semester. They liked what I did, they hired me the next semester, but it was um, temporary. I quit my job at Columbia. I started to teach full time, but as an adjunct, they hired me to teach a bunch of classes the next semester and they said, oh, that professor who was sick, who uh, was, you know, you're teaching his neuropsychology class, he's, he's back, he's the tenured professor, so he's gonna pick whatever class he wants, but no one wants to teach um, the stats class here. Do you wanna come teach statistics? Um, I had quit my job at Columbia. We had a baby on the way. Uh, and I didn't want to teach statistics. Oh, and do you want to teach statistics uh, for three hours a night, Monday through Thursday, to people who have worked all day and then come in to do their undergraduate degrees at night? No, I didn't want to do it. But I, I had motivation to do it. I had reason to do it. And I did it. Um, I don't think I was a good teacher at first. Specifically, I didn't gain any confidence yet but after the first semester, I remember some of my students in that class. To this day, I remember their names. I remember Thea and Liz and John uh, and Ibrahim. They were, I remember them because they were personalities and they had their own individual struggles learning stats, but all of them passed. Um, a lot of people don't pass stats. That's something else you should know. A lot of people don't pass. 
I watched them struggle and stick with it and stick with me, even though I didn't know what I was doing. And it was something that they later developed excellence in. So that was really encouraging to me. Next semester, they said, we loved how you taught that stats class. Really, it was that no one else wanted to teach it. And they said, do you want to do that again? I said, this is great. They're paying me full-time salary. I even got um, health benefit, but it was good. And, and I enjoyed it. And then I realized I liked it. And then I wanted to get better at it. And I started to tweak things in the way I taught it. I started to cut out things and include other things. I changed my pedagogy. I changed the assignments. And I saw some improvements in the students passing uh, year over year. So I cut my teeth teaching on stats and I began to develop over the long haul a real love for it. And then when I sort of looked back, we had a kid and raising kids in New York is rough and uh, wanted to move back closer to family. So I applied for jobs out here and uh, I got the job here at Cosumnes River College and to teach bio psych and stats and I got to a community college and I realized this is exactly where I'm supposed to be is teaching community college statistics and that's because of my journey my journey being one not somebody who majored in math and loves statistics and just thinks about it all the time and wants to do it but somebody who had to do stats failed so much in my own mind for sure and learned to grow intellectually so that math and statistics became a part of who I am and now really guide my decision making, my pursuits, um, and what I want to do with students. And that's encourage you. Incorporating math into your life is something that will benefit you tremendously. Even if it isn't, a process of you journeying through this difficult intellectual territory is going to build you up. It's going to make you a better scholar, a better thinker, a better conversation partner, you are going to be better for doing this journey. I'm encouraged to see you go from where you are today to where you are at the end of the semester when we'll have this conversation again and I'll say, think of how you felt about math. Think about how you felt about what you do in your life, how you pursue things, and think about how far you've come in just a single semester. That's, that's where we end up is giving you the perspective so you don't continue to think you're bad at math. That you know no one's either good or bad at math, but people do put in different amounts of time. They do put in different amounts of work. Obviously, right, half of my class at UC Irvine failed. Now what did they do with that failure? Did they internalize it and say, I'm a failure? Or did they motivate themselves to do some of those things that were efficacious in my journey of making me be able to pass more and more difficult classes and stats and then even begin to utilize it you know in peer-reviewed journals i've published with statistics are you able to find a way that math can be incorporated into your life so that you feel more confident in your ability to study all sorts of things that are difficult in every area, not just academics. This is a really life-changing class. So please understand we're not just here to do math. We're going to do plenty of math, but I'm here to transform you and to help you on your journey being transformed mostly by your decision to put in effort. That's where I know the variability is in this class. It doesn't have to do with where you come from. It doesn't have to do with what you look like. It doesn't have to do with any immutable characteristic of you, but it does have to do with your free choice to continue pursuing this class. So I hope that's enough motivation that you guys will take me seriously that I can't wait to see from today to 16 weeks from now. I can't wait to get to know you on that journey because it's the most encouraging thing for me as a teacher. That's where I get a lot of my motivation. Sometimes students, you know, this time, uh, a couple days ago, I got an email from a former student. She's like, I'm applying to grad school. And that, that's really wonderful. I love hearing from my former students. But my real joy in teaching comes from watching you guys journey. And again, not in a sadistic way, but in a way that I trust from today, where you feel incompetent, probably are, to going through a process of developing your resilience, your your stick to itiveness, your you become more a more powerful person by struggling with something you don't want to do and dedicating yourselves, committing yourselves to a process of learning, and then somewhere along the way, 
you won't see it. I'll see it first. You won't see it. And I'll have to point it out to you. You develop understanding that you didn't think you could yet. You, your world expands. Your brain's capacity grows. Uh, and and I'm, I'm encouraged by that. So when you get down, come watch this video again. Because it's true from today until the 16 weeks from now when we finish this semester. This is the process that you're undergoing. If you need the motivation, remember, remember me. I was a failure. Uh, those C minuses were real. They're still on my transcripts, you know. I can't believe they hired me to teach stats. But the narrative, the story, is what's compelling about me. It's the story we all want to tell. It's the story of every montage scene you've ever seen in a movie. But the montage cuts over the reality of life. The narrative says, you stick with it, you get better. You know, Malcolm Gladwell says, you spend 10,000 hours, you become an expert. 10,000 hours is a long time. This is not easy. But nothing that's worth having is easy to get. So, let's go. Let's get started with stats.